Uh, turn to First Corinthians and chapter ten, and we're going to go to verse. Uh, uh, pardon me, chapter one and uh, verse ten. Now I got to go back. Oh my goodness, this is going to be. Here we go, one and ten. Amen. They probably got it up behind me here anyway. I'm going to read one verse and then we'll uh, we'll get into our Bible study tonight. And uh, we're continuing to talk about unity and the importance of us being the body of Christ. And not only claiming to be the body of Christ, but actually being the body of Christ. And there's a big difference. Lots of people say they're saved. There's lots of people say they're born again. Lots of people say, you know, I'm part of the body. But uh, you have got to be a part of the body to be a part of the body. Amen. You've got to be interacting with the rest of the body or you die. And uh, just like my brother's thumb, right? It just didn't move. Yeah, anybody, you ever, uh, <laughs> back in the old times, I used to love watching old science fiction and horror shows. Do you ever watch that one the, called The Hand? You know, where, oh, there, see, Elaine's, Elaine knows. And this hand, you know, this, this car took off and this hand was attached to the 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 handle and and the car the hand was alive you know and it's just doesn't happen you know <laughs> thankfully those things don't happen <laughs> what's that only with robotics that's right and uh, <laughs> for a little, for a short time uh, verse ten. Uh, but I in, urge you and, and entreat you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you uh, be in perfect harmony and full agreement in what you say, and that there be no dissensions or factions or divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in your common understanding and in your opinions and in your judgments. And that is, are we having difficulties here, technical difficulties? We must be. Alrighty, let's, uh, let's pray, shall we? Thank you, Jesus, for your word. And Lord, I just pray that tonight I'll be able to relay it in such a way. Jesus, I want it to change me. And I want it to change those that you have given to this church to minister given to this church so that I might minister to them God I've got to be able to say it in such a way that that Lord it will be received Lord help them not to be bored help them not to just be thinking of other things but to center their hearts and minds and attentions on your word tonight in Jesus name amen God bless you you may be seated in Jesus name uh, you'll notice in this uh, passage of Scripture that it's, uh, it's talking again about unity, which has been our subject and will be for also one more study after this next Sunday as well. And uh, today we're going to talk about the hindrances to unity. And uh, look at there. Success, eh? He's got this on a PowerPoint back there. So, uh, it's to- yeah, it's how we... Just we're right uptown here, aren't we? So there are some hindrances to us being able to operate effectively as the body of Christ. And uh, the, the absolute necessity of be, us being able to has never been more clear to me than it has in the last while. And not because of anything that I see that may be a problem, although we have had our share of difficulties sometimes with people... Uh, having been offended and unable to forgive. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight as well. And, uh, and so we, we want to make sure that we are the body of Christ. The body of Christ has to work together. But there's some things that fight against us being able to work together. And uh, we'll be touching on some of these scriptures that you see up behind me as we go along. Um, but the first one, I, 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 I deliberately didn't choose any scriptures to talk about this one. And uh, it's so obvious that most of you are going to say, yeah, well, that's just, you know, we know this. So, so but let's, let's just go to the obvious anyway. Because the Bible tells us, and, and I don't have that scripture up here, but that the enemy, Satan, the devil, our adversary, he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, just, I want you to understand something. He already has those out there. Yeah. 
that aren't a part of the body of Christ. So whom is he seeking to devour? Those that belong to the body of Christ. Now, we as, as individuals, you know, just like the multitude of cells that make up your body, we as individuals and, and all of those around the world that are a part of the body of Christ, we make up this body. But, but let me just take that analogy and just put it aside for a moment. And I want you to think about how a lion hunts. Because what they try and do, first of all, is they will observe whatever it is that they're chasing after, and, and then they're going to try and pick the weakest, the slowest, and the one that they can divide apart and get apart from the herd. Yeah, that's true. And that's the way that they hunt. So uh, uh, the first thing that's going to happen and, and the first hindrance or obstacle or, or whatever to, to us being unified is, of course, the things that the enemy tries to say to you that try and get you to divide yourself from the body of Christ. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever felt this way, but I know that, that there have been some that I have known and counseled that have, have had this, this feeling like nobody in the church likes them. Or, here's another one, I don't serve any purpose in the church, I can't do anything, I'm, I'm virtually useless, and, and, uh, and those kind of thoughts come to them. And, and the reason, there's a reason for those thoughts. Yeah. It's, it's not to try and encourage you or build you up or edify you. So, I want you to consider, first of all, when God comes into our lives, even when we do something wrong, He comes in with hope. He comes in with, with grace and with mercy and he, and he may, there may be a rebuke from the preaching or, or from what we've read or maybe in the spirit we'll feel it, but there's always that urging towards repentance, always that urging towards grace and with mercy. Whereas the enemy, when he comes in, does not give you hope. So whenever you get to feeling that way about yourself, understand something. It's not God telling you you're useless. It's not God trying to, trying to say that everybody doesn't like you in the church or nobody cares about you. That's not God telling you that. And you may even reason within yourself and start uh, to look at all the times. And, and he's so good at doing it to point out the times when somebody was too busy to go for coffee with you. Or they happened to walk by you in church and didn't say hi and didn't give you a hug or didn't shake your hand or, or whatnot. And he's so good. And so let me, let me, what he does is he'll say to Elaine, he says, listen, pastor ignored you today. You know, he didn't say hi to you. And, and look at that. Kelly is, Kelly, this is your daughter-in-law behind you. And, and listen, she hasn't, you know, she hasn't even said boo to you today. And he's going to, and, and he won't concentrate on the one so bill came up and said hi to you but but he want you to forget that bill was nice to you and he's just going to talk about the ones that happen to be because of their life because they're busy because of whatever's going on in their own lives that didn't do it and he's going to keep pointing those out and honestly you can build up a whole case in your mind that he's telling you the truth have you ever done that (laughs) <laughs> it's like the story my pastor told me when I was, uh, or told us in the congregation when we were first in the church, and and uh, and he said uh, there was this this guy that ran out of gas, and I've told you the story, and and he was a long ways away, and it was out in farm country, and and he ran out of gas, and he's looking off in the distance, he can see the house off in the distance, and he said, hmm, I bet you, you know, all these farmers, they always have this, you know, gas there for their you know, their various tractors and things that they have, on, and and so as he's walking, it's starting to get dark out, and it's it's for than what he thought it was and, and he sees the lights come on inside the house and he begins talking to himself and he's thinking, you know what, I bet you they're going to be upset that I'm going to come there and, and he goes through this whole process during the time that he's walking and then he sees the lights go off in the house and he says, oh, they've gone to bed now and, I, and now I'm going to wake them up in order to do this and, uh, and so he's building up this whole case in his mind how they're going to be so angry with him when he gets there to ask for gas for his vehicle so he can get to where he wants to go and finally he gets there and he knocks on the door and the guy from the upstairs window looks out and says, hey, what do you need or what do you want? And he says, well, you can just keep your gas and turned around and walked back, walked back to his vehicle. <laughs> so we can do that. And the enemy has a way of, of making us feel like, like we're the only ones that are, are doing things right and nobody's with us and nobody likes us. And, and uh, he honestly, he just, he doesn't have any rules of engagement. There's no Geneva code for the enemy. 
None at all. The fact is, I can almost guarantee you that the time you're going through the worst times in your life are the times that he's going to renew his efforts with more energy and more diligence at trying to get you to divide away at your weakest time. What's that? That's what he does. Try and divide you away so he can devour you. Understand something about the enemy. He, doesn't, he may try and tempt you at times with saying there's, there's greener grass outside, but in the end result, he's not interested in you getting any better than what you are. He wants to devour you physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, in every way that he can. He wants to take everything that you have and leave you with nothing except an empty life. And then he'll take that too. So he doesn't know of any. When you're weak, he attacks with greater energy and application of effort. And he seeks only to destroy the body of Christ. So, no, so if he can get us to be ineffective, if he can get us so that we're just so busy infighting, and we're so busy picking at each other, and we're so busy criticizing each other, and we're so busy worrying about what this doesn't do or look right, or the youth doesn't do good, or the, the Sunday school's not operating right, or the pastor didn't preach the message the right way, or the colors are wrong, or whatever the case may be. If he can get us looking that way at each other and about the church, then he's won. Even if every one of us stay here till the Lord comes, and we're all just happy here, you know, living for God, because... If he can't get you to backslide, and if he can't get you to walk out on God, then the next step that he's going to do is he's going to make you so ineffective in your, your ministry that God wants you to do as a part of the body of Christ that you won't do anything. And uh, by virtue of that, then we all just kind of have our own little club here, don't we? Don't take it. Uh, as much as we should not underestimate, because he's had thousands of years to practice his trade, he's had years of observing your weaknesses, your, your failings, your, the times that you do the worst and the times that you do good. So uh, all of that, we should not underestimate what he can throw at us, but likewise we should not overestimate him as well. Because by the power in Jesus' name and by the Holy Ghost, he has no power over us. And uh, so the Bible says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. So can I just, whenever you have thoughts that drag you down, that make it negative or critical, or, or you look around and you can't see anything good going on around you, whenever you have thoughts like that, you resist those thoughts, you rebuke those thoughts, and you say, get out of my life, get out of my mind, in Jesus' name, you have no power over me. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says in one portion, I wish I had looked up the scripture, that, that God flicks him away with his little finger like like they're not even they're not even close to equals i know that the cartoons and everything have god on one side and the devil on the other side like they're they're fighting this battle over us but satan's a created being he's nowhere close to god he wanted to be god but he's nowhere close he's somewhere down there somewhere and god doesn't even uh, it doesn't take very much for god to get rid of him and all we have to do is access the power that god has given to each in every one of us. The other thing you can do that he absolutely hates. Ignore him. He lo have you noticed that when the Bible talks about him backsliding or falling away. The whole passage of scripture is I will ascend up. I will do this. He wants that attention. So. Every time the enemy comes and says something to you, why don't you just lift up your hands and say, just begin to worship God. Just ignore him completely. He's going to say, I was talking to you. <laughs> what are you doing? You know, I, I was speaking into your mind. And, and if you ignore him, he cannot hardly stand that. And I just, you know, I just love to just give him a kick every once in a while. You know, just you know, comes in and says something, you know, in my life. And, and you just say, oh, thank you, Jesus, for what you've done. Thank you, Jesus, for forgiveness and mercy and grace. Thank you, Jesus, for my family. Thank you for my church family. Thank you, Lord, for, for how you've taken care of me financially. And it's, that's been a miracle. Thank you for this building that you've given us and the property that we have. And, and God, we have so much to be thankful for. Amen. So ignore him. Just go and do the opposite of what he says. He'll hate it. Amen. Romans chapter 12 and uh, verse 16. We're going to go there. And see if I can do this a little quicker. 
If I press the right buttons, it works, right? Amen. Uh, so this is a part of the two chapters that we've been studying over the last, uh, this will be the third, third, is it third, fourth, fourth week. And uh, so this comes from Romans chapter 12. And so taking it in context, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you again. In verse 16, it says, live in harmony with one another. And then it says, do not be haughty, snobbish, high-minded, exclusive, but readily adjust yourselves to people and things and give yourself to humble tasks. Never overestimate yourself or be wise in your own conceits. So number two, first one that is a hindrance to unity or an obstruction to unity is, of course, the enemy. But I want to go to these three that I'm going to talk about next because these are more a part of our lives. They're a part of our makeup. And the first one is pride. It's the first hindrance that we have within our spirits. And all of us have a certain amount of pride. And, and that it can cause division within a church. Um, I know the, uh, be careful because I'm going to be on YouTube, but I know churches at one time had people that had a lot of money in them could actually buy their way into heaven. And there were people that could buy, and we were joking about this on Sunday, I think we should go to, you know, pew chairs, and, and we can just get everybody in the church to buy their own row, and then we'll put their names on it. <laughs> so we can buy our own seats in in the kingdom and and God help anybody who sits in my chair. You know. But pride can come in in a, in a number of different ways into our lives and I've seen people that that may not look that proud on the outside as far as the physical terms but some people are so spiritually proud that that it's just terrible. The Pharisees were like that and Jesus had almost no no use for them at all and was the most when you look at Jesus's sayings he had the least bit of tolerance it seems for those that should have known better but were spiritually proud and thought themselves better than everybody else and so the one thing that can get in our spirits that's probably a part of every one of our spirits to a certain degree since the fall of Adam and the fall of man is is pride and uh, so Psalms 10 and 2 Said, says this, says the wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Now, let me just kind of... Pride causes you to look down on others that are around you. And then what it's going to cause you to do, not only to look down on them, but you may find yourself in a position where you're with somebody else in that same status that you seem to feel that you are. Ministry can do this. You know, you can get ministers who, who are, you know, it's like we've got our club and, and the saints aren't a part of that club, you know. And, hey, I'm going to say it. This is, if this goes on YouTube and people watch it, that's wrong. Because right. we're all just saints of God making, and all of us just have a different part within his kingdom. And, and we perform different functions within, that, within the kingdom and within the body of Christ. But, but I'm no better than any of you. I still, boy, when I sin, I've still got to come to an altar and I've got to repent. When I make a mistake and I fail God, and I do, I've still got to do the same thing that you do. I've got to go to the foot of the cross and ask that the blood of Jesus Christ would wash over me again and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I'm no different than you. It's just a different position, that's all, in the body. And uh, and so God, uh, it, it may look like by man's terms that there's greater honor in, in being behind a pulpit or playing music or whatever it is uh, that people do. But God makes sure that he gives greater honor to those that may not have a prominent position so that there would not be any division within the body. So, so nobody has the opportunity to get lifted up and proud. Everybody said amen. amen. Eventually you'll begin to pick on people if you feel prideful. And when it says persecuting the poor, it means persecuting those that you feel are in lower status than you. That you'll begin to, to persecute them. Uh, We've got to be really careful. Uh, We've got to be really careful when people come in. And, and when my wife and I came in, my wife was much more spiritual than me. And uh, <laughs> she can hear me. She's in the, she's in the baby room back there. And, uh, and so when we came in, she, she just asked my pastor or my pastor's wife, I can't remember. She says, well, you know, okay, this looks good. What do I have to do? So, and she says, okay, let's do it. So we'll do. 
Uh, me, on the other hand, was a little bit, you know, a little bit more of a struggle. I, I was extremely proud. The fact is, when I first walked into the back of that church, and, uh, and I remember this so clearly, this feeling, you know, this small little church, they really need me to be here. Really? <laughs> you know? And I'm thinking to myself, it's no wonder. It's no wonder that, that people that would come and get the Holy Ghost and, and before me, because I, I had some stuff to work out in me, you know? And, uh, and so we, we've got to be so very careful that... Oh, I almost forgot what I was going to say. It doesn't matter how long people have been on the road to where they're going. The fact that, that we may have been in this position longer does not mean that we can judge everybody according to the way that we live for God. Because that's really a temptation of the prideful. Well, bless God, I didn't, you know, and I've heard this saying, you know, of, of ministers down in the Bible Belt saying about those of us in B.C., they just don't know how to build churches up there. They, you know, and so they come up here, and we've had some come up here and try and start churches and, and leave after six months or a year. Because yeah. it's not the same thing. Yeah. And what are they doing? They're thinking, well, we're, we've got it together. We, you know, we had a missionary come in and say that down in the Bible Belt, you could go in and put up a placard on the side saying, I'm opening a church and have 50 people the first day. Just people that are disillusioned with all the other churches in the, around you. You can have 50 people the first day. It's different up here. So, I can't judge any of you according to the way that I live for God. That's based on pride. Neither can you base or judge me because you do things differently because you're on the same road but you're an individual you're unique your relationship with God is your relationship with God and just as with each one of our, your children you deal with them differently you don't deal with them all the same because they have such different personalities and characters and so God understands us and knows what we need and how, knows how fast we can grow and knows how quickly we can make it down that road and so God in his patience kindness mercy and grace is going to help each one of us to keep on growing at the rate that suits us in our personalities and characters so I cannot judge somebody else who doesn't grow like I do because in other, some areas of my life, I probably don't grow as quickly as they do. Yeah. And so uh, those things stem from pride. But you'll know that those things cause division in the body if we become judgmental and if we look down on those that are around us. Uh, Proverbs 16 and 18 says, Pride goeth before destruction, haughty spirit before a fall. And, uh, of course, we you know always assume that... that <clears throat> Pardon me, is the one that uh, that has the pride in their spirit. And I do believe that, but I believe that that sort of judgmentalism can cause others to fall as well. That it's not just the one that is prideful and the one that is judgmental. Um, pride makes us feel like we don't have to relate to those that are not at our own perceived level, whether it's intellectually, spiritually, physically, financially, or socially. And, and so we've really got to watch ourselves in all those different areas that we're not socially elite. We're not going to be financially elitist. We're not going to be physically elitist. We're not going to be spiritual elitist. And we're not going to be intellectual elitist. Because in all of those areas, we can cause pe other people to, uh, to struggle in wanting to be a part of the body of Christ because they'll feel like they just don't belong or they're not good enough. We need as much as possible when new people come in to relate to them. You can't do that if you're already proud. You can't go up to a sinner and maybe somebody that's struggling with addiction and, and talk about it. back for me 30 some odd years ago when God delivered me from some things. Because, bless God, we're ministry now. We can just, oh, we've got this look, you know, and this thing that we do. Well, how about, how about you just go and you just say, you know, I'm just a sinner just like you. And, and I need to come to the cross again today. Jesus needs to wash me again today. And so I'm going to ask him to do so. I'm going to let, let Jesus know that, that my life 
is not right and, and that I need to get right. Why don't you just, why don't we just pray together about this? Amen. Hallelujah. We can, uh, we can make such a difference in people's lives if we do. Um, number two of the three that are in our spirit uh, is, uh, let me see here, uh, from Exodus 2017. And it is the 10th commandment. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, wife, servants, animals, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And so I wrote this down, uh, jealousy and covetousness um, can divide. Basically what it is, 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 and I wrote down the term here, lust, because lust is not necessarily sexual, but lust is about us having an inordinate desire for something that is somebody else's that does not belong to us. Yeah. Lust has one, one thing it wants to do. Please itself. It, it's not like desire. It's not like a relationship between a man and a woman where it should be a mutual wanting to please each other in that relationship. Lust only seeks to please itself. And it will harm. It will hurt it will do whatever is necessary to reach its own goals. And so um, we have a couple examples in the Bible. Uh, but Jesus said in Luke 12 and 15, I'm probably jumping around here, so Terry's going to have a hard time. You know, maybe not. He's, he's good back there. It says, take, and, take heed and beware of covetousness. Paul called covetousness idolatry in Colossians 3 and 5 and tells us to put it to death in our lives. And because it divides. Let me show you. Um, I'll just use the one example because we'll run out of time if I use both of them. Let's go to Luke chapter 15, verse 28. If you want to put that up behind me, Terry. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. How many know where this is from? The prodigal son. It's the older brother, isn't it? And so we have the prodigal goes out, takes his inheritance, goes out and spends it, spends his time with uh, loose women and uh, all sorts of things out there. Finally, he's in such a state, nobody will hang around with him anymore because what he had is gone. And he finds himself eating or feeding the pigs and would have eaten what the pigs, pigs ate, except he came to himself and made his way back. When he got back, he said, uh, I am not worthy to be your son. Uh, just let me be a servant in your house. And, and, of course, the father said, my son who was dead and is alive and put the cloak on him, put the ring on his finger and, and killed the fatted calf. And they began to have a great big party for the son that, that came back. And the elder son. Who never left, but he worked within his father's kingdom, says, and he was angry and would not, you see the division, would not go in because of jealousy and because of covetousness. You see how that can just ruin? This is, we're talking about a family here, but, but this parable is about the family of God. And, and sometimes people get so messed up because somebody else has, has an opportunity to sing or opportunity to preach or opportunity to teach or, or somebody else gets a position or somebody else does this. And you know what? I, honestly, it destroys you and it destroys your relationship with those that are around you when you feel that way. God knows what he's doing in all of our lives. And, and the best thing that any one of us can do in the kingdom of God is, is rather than look at anything that anybody else has. Listen, that's the reason so many of our young couples get in debt so quickly. I think Andy talked about it on Sunday a little bit. But uh, maybe it wasn't him. Maybe it was somebody else. They all want things right now. Yeah. They look at their parents and they say, but I don't want to wait for that. Till I'm 40 or 50 and have, you know, and I was reading this thing that Dave Ramsey sent me today. It says my 40s were, the, were my, my greatest earning capacity of my life was during my 40s. I must have missed that, you know. <laughs> missed all of that time. It always seems like we're just 
you know, paycheck to paycheck and, <laughs> and stuff. But my kids look at it, and, and your kids look at it, and they think, oh, I don't want to wait. So I can go and borrow money, and I can go and get credit cards, and, and I can do this, and I can do that. And, and they want it all right away. And it's kind of a shame, but that's the way we are sometimes spiritually. People come in and they want, they want all of this spiritual growth in a moment, in, in just right now. And if they don't get it, lots of them will leave because, well, bless God, I didn't get what I needed there, so I'm going to go somewhere else. There's no faithfulness in that kind of a relationship with God. There's no, well, God's going to help me to grow and God's going to help me to learn and I'm going to, I'm going to discipline myself. I'm going to set some things in place where God can begin to help me. I'm going, to, I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray. I'm going to make sure I'm at Bible study. I'm going to make sure I'm there to worship with God's people. And, and so this covetousness of wanting things right away uh, can take away from, from people's faithfulness in the kingdom of God. And so this elder son, you'll notice... Uh, Anybody ever read what the father said to the elder son? Just passing, nothing. What? All that I have is yours. My servants will be your servants. My kingdom, my land is going to be yours. Yes, the prodigal is back in the kingdom. Yes, he's still going to be a part of it. But everything I own is yours because you were faithful and you stayed. Hmm. Interesting. Anyway, um, so uh, let's go to the number three, and we'll finish off with this one. The third uh, hindrance to uh, to unity. It's probably the greatest one that is within each and every one of us, uh, and that is the uh, unforgiveness that some of us harbor sometimes. I had a hard time with, with some of this. Hard time when I was first in the church and still occasionally I, uh, I struggle sometimes with making sure that I forgive. More marriages have broken up because the spouse on either side, one of them was unable to forgive or maybe both. Many churches, pastors, people have walked away and separated themselves from the family of God because they could not learn how to forgive. If I could put one thing in your heart, mind, soul today, it would be that you forgive from the smallest little thing to the greatest things that you begin to practice forgiveness. It's not going to come easy. There's going to be times when you are going to be so offended that you are going to wonder if you're going to be ever able to, to relate with that person again. Speak to that person again. So, uh, more than any of the above, this is the reason for separation and division. Uh, the Bible tells us this, it is doubtless that offenses will come. <laughs> it's going to happen. And let me tell you something about when it does happen. It's, it's really hard for people that I just know on the outside or that maybe I just know peripherally in my in my life really hard for them to offend me because I don't really care that much whether they say things about me or not you know like it's just the way it is in fact as the Bible says that there's gonna be a lot of people that will speak negative things about me but people that I love people that I care about that's a, that's a whole different thing. I love all of you. So if you say negative things about me, that hurts me. If I say negative things about you, I'm thinking that it would hurt you too, right? No, none of you say negative things about me. I'm, I'm absolutely positive of that. But, but it, it would bother me. And, and it bothered me with, with family members and things that happened to me back way back when. And, and I had a hard time with it. And then it happened to me within the church. It happened to me with when I was first in the ministry and first was here in Port Alberta. Uh, there were other ministers that, that were involved. And, and for a little while, it looked like they might take my license. And, uh, and I felt like I'd done the right thing because I'd done what the Bible said. And, and yet it still seemed to turn around and come back at me again. And it's hard. And I'm not going to tell you it's going to be easy. 
But I was talking to somebody recently and mentioning that, that, you know, the greatest reason that we have a hard time forgiving is because we within ourselves need to experience God's forgiveness in our lives again. And most of the time when we can't forgive others, it's because we haven't really experienced the forgiveness of God for something in our own lives. But boy, when that washes over you, oh boy, I feel the Holy Ghost. When that forgiveness washes over you and through and into your life and your heart and your mind, boy, it's really hard. But I want to run around and hug everybody. I just, you know, I, I got no reason to hold a grudge anymore. Listen, I don't care what you said or what you did. You know what? Every time I get behind the pulpit, every time I preach or teach, I just feel like God's going to wash over all of us and help us to be unified and one and that we're going to work together as a, as a body of Christ and that there won't be any division. And what I felt before, I'm not going to feel again because after all, how could, I, how could I hold a grudge when I've just experienced that miraculous forgiveness in my own life? Amen. So forgiveness. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes, so let me let me go through some scriptures here that I'm sure Terry will put up behind me. Uh, doubtless offenses will come. Um, whether we can learn how to forgive will be the deciding factor of whether we are forgiven. Now, this may go contrary to some teaching that's in our world today. Um, Mark eleven twenty five. Let me just. Uh, Read some scripture so that you can uh, you can get a grasp on it from from the Bible and not from my words. Uh, Mark eleven twenty five. When you uh, stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any. Everybody say any. any. How many does that include? Everybody. Everybody. When you stand praying, forgive if you have aught against any, that your Father also which is in heaven may. Forgive your trespasses. Uh, Luke 17, 1 through 5, if you want to go there. So, according to Mark eleven twenty five that we just read, our forgiveness from God is dependent upon our forgiveness of others. Luke 17, let me see here. Let me just get there. Uh-oh, we're in trouble now. It is? Oh, good, because... Uh, my uh, tablet won't find it. Um, <laughs> then said he unto his disciples, it is impossible but that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. In other words, we should be working very, very hard, not necessarily not to be offended, but not to offend. Right? Through whom they come. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he cast into the sea than he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If any, man, any brother, if thy brother, sorry, trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day and seven times in a day turn again to thee saying, I repent, thou shalt, sounds like a commandment, doesn't it? Forgive him. And it's no wonder the apostle said this. <laughs> oh, God, you got to help me with this. <laughs> I can't do this. <laughs> you know, you know I'm, I just want to hit them back. <laughs> just, you know, you ever get that? You just want to hit them? Yeah. You know, our brother, brother Mahaney in, in New West Church saying, you know, I went to, into the pub to testify to these people after I was first saved, and this guy was giving me a hard time. And, and the next thing I knew, I had his shirt in my hand, and he was on the floor. And Brother Haney was a huge man, big man. He had the, one of the greatest prison ministries in our organization ever, but uh, came from a pretty rough life. Uh, yeah, we don't want to do that. That's not good, uh, good stuff. So, uh, so increase our faith that we can be able to, uh, to learn how to forgive effectively. One more passage of Scripture I'm going to read, and that's in Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Uh, Look at this. I'm just, yeah, get out of there. I don't want to forgive this thing right now. So I'm having a hard time. <laughs> it's inanimate. I could, I could throw it, right? All righty. Let's read this, and, uh, and then we'll close. It says, Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him till seven times? Because that's what Jesus had said in Luke, right? 
Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Now that's, by my way of thinking, 490, is that correct? Huh? Per event, per day. Per event, per day. Same event, same, same offense, a day. So if you make it to, you know, midnight, whatever you consider to be the day that wasn't their day, and, uh, and you get there and you're only at 489, you've got to start all over again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, there, uh, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And so this is the parable that Jesus tells in order to uh, convince Peter and the apostles that they should do right. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. Uh, my Amplified says about $10 million. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children and all that he had and payment to be made. Uh, the servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, about ten or twenty dollars or something like that. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down on his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. I don't know how he's going to pay off his debt while he's in prison, but anyway. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that, he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because thou desirest me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Strong words. Let's stand together, shall we? It's the only scripture that we have that's comparable. That There's nothing, actually nothing comparable to this scripture. Because everywhere in the Bible we find God's grace, God's mercy, God's forgiveness. And that if we'll just hang in there and do the right thing and love people and, and be spiritual and, and be godly and be part of the body, that, that everything's going to be wonderful. And this passage of Scripture says that if we cannot forgive others after God has forgiven us so much, that all of the original debt is now payable and due. Now that's frightening because I owed a lot. So uh, these three things within our spirits that can be a hindrance to us having unity. I want us to have that spirit of forgiveness in us. Start it with the little things, the little offenses that you feel. And one passage of scripture actually says, I think it's in the Amplified, make excuses for people. So if somebody does something that may offend you, make an excuse. Well, maybe they're having a rough day. Maybe, maybe they've got family problems. Maybe there's something going on that I don't know about. And you begin to make excuses for people and you excuse them and you forgive them for the things that... Start with your spouse. Forgive them the little things that may annoy you. Sister Nickel. Oh, <laughs> she's looking at me like, honey, forgive me the little things that I do. I know I'm in trouble already. There's nothing new about that. Uh, uh, but it's good practice. It's good practice. I find that, that sometimes husbands and wives are the least gracious with each other, and they're so gracious with others outside of the church. So learn to be gracious with each other. It's good practice for you. And then when the big things come, you'll be so in tune with already learning how to forgive, you'll have no trouble at all just saying, yeah, I can get through this. Me and God together. Hand in hand. We're going to make it. Amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your word. Lord, I, I just have felt so strongly your spirit leading in, in these Bible studies and, and messages that you have given me. And I thank you, Lord, for your, your voice that speaks into our hearts. 
God, I know that there is just so much that you are right now doing within this church, within each one of us. And Lord, just continue to lead us, Lord. It's not necessarily about whether or not this church is full yet, but God, I know that it can and it will be, Lord, when we begin to reach out for those that are around us, when we become the body of Christ, because it is truly your will to seek and to save those that are lost. But first of all, we need to be in one mind, one accord, just as the early church was. And then we can watch your power flowing through us and touching those that are around us. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You may be dismissed in Jesus' name.